Hello, everyone. My name is Seth Green, and I lead the Bompart Center at Loyola University, Chicago. And on an afternoon like this one, where we are talking about how business can be part of the response to COVID-19, uh, I am especially grateful to be with all of you. Um, I want to start by saying how much we appreciate the role that all of you are playing in this moment. I looked over our RSVP list and it includes many of the nonprofit and corporate social responsibility leaders who are truly helping the folks who were already marginalized in our economy before this moment uh, to have hopefully less of an impact from the challenge of this moment. And so um, I wanna just express our great gratitude to everyone who is a part of this conversation. Um, and I also want to share our wishes for your health and your safety and your self-care amidst this moment. Uh, we are going to have a conversation for the next hour with scholars and leaders who are responding from their businesses to this challenging time. And we hope over the course of this conversation to give you tools on how you might lead with purpose amidst this moment as well. Uh, let me just give you a quick overview of what our look like, and then I'll give you the briefest of introductions to our center, because I saw many new uh, names on our list, and then we're going to jump right in to the real meat of the conversation. Uh, so after my brief introduction, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Jennifer J. Griffin, uh, who's going to share a strategic overview of social responsibility and how to think about these issues, especially in moments of crisis. Uh, we're then going to turn to four business case studies. We have Fifth Third Bank, we have Comcast, we have EY, and we have Dina represented. And I'll introduce each of the individual speakers when we share their genius with you. Uh, and then we're going to be turning over to what we call power round questions. Um, that is where we're going to ask um, just a couple of our panelists to share responses to your questions. And so I want to encourage you to use the chat function to share questions you may have. And then we're going to have a closing from Destiny Ortega, who is a senior associate of the Civic Consulting Alliance. They have been tasked by the mayor's office to help organize the business community in this moment of response. And she's gonna be sharing some of their next steps. So all of you know, not only how business is responding, but how you can be part of a broader collaborative effort that ensures we are all working together in this moment. So I just wanna briefly introduce you to the Bombhart Center because I did see a number of new names and I'll just share in the snapshot version that we are a center that focuses on how to integrate business strategy and social purpose to advance the greater good. And there are three things we'd love you to know about us. The first is that we truly are part of a university, Loyola, that leads with purpose in this space. We are very proud to have had a history that dates back to Father Baumhart of being a leader in social responsibility. And just last year, the Financial Times, which surveys 250 schools across the world, uh, found us to be one of the top four in social purpose and business education. That's because it's core to our Jesuit mission and we try to organize every business tool in our university for the purpose of advancing a better world. Uh, what we also want you to know is our brief theory of change, which has two parts. We believe that we need to equip leaders that are going to take these values to the top of business in the future. And that's why we have a number of educational programs. Our signature is an MBA exclusively for people who want to marry profit and purpose. And you can see the first cohort here full of extraordinary individuals from all sectors who are driving that change. The second part of our theory of change is that we think we need to change the norms in business. And so we have an annual award that is raising the standards for business. You can see our awardees here from our most recent series. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Jennifer J. Griffin, uh, who's going to share with you her insights from a multiple uh, <laughs> decades worth of being both a scholar and originally a practitioner in this area. And so uh, Jennifer, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Seth. And thank you for pulling together this wonderful panel. Um, because at this point in time, during these moments of crisis, it really is the character of the organization, the character of the leaders that comes through. So 
what organizations may say they do and what they do do, this is the point where the rubber hits the road and that trust is either built or destroyed and sometimes destroyed forever. And so if we're thinking about crises, I went back to dusted off some of my PowerPoints from 2001 as an acute versus a chronic crisis. And it's very true what was being said back in the day that these are the kinds of things where the truth is you don't have a clue about what to do. It is not business as usual. It is uncharted territory. So hats off and kudos to all those doctors, dentists, hospitals, home care workers. Um, that are working, but we can already see some of the different activities that airlines, distilleries are making, hand sanitizers now, hotels and restaurants are making. But if you go on to the next slide, it is really a human tragedy, um, not a financial tragedy. And this is really what's key, is that are you putting, as organizations, are you putting profits before people or is the focus on the people? And so all of those folks that had signed up with the Business Roundtable um, about stakeholder first, they're being tested. Is it about people? Because often ESG or CSR might be considered a very narrow tick box sort of perspective. And if so, um, that's more about CSR talk, but the CSR walk means that how embedded, how deeply infiltrated are the people that you work with, whether it is employees or customers or clients, um, suppliers or community. And this is where that is really tested. And so these intangibles of how deeply embedded CSR or ESG is throughout the organization is being tested. And if you go on to the next one. It really is about employees. And the next one. So if you are in a crisis as an organization, how is it that you are communicating with your employees? Because if your activities, if your ESG and CSR activities are tied with your employees and employees are core to your business, then um, these activities are never redundant. But if it's, not cord, if it's not tied strategically to the core of the business, the activities that you do with your employees, um, then it can be made redundant. And so for example, when you have the why, what, how of organizations, what might be happening right now is layoffs. And I just saw some corporations like Mark Benioff with Salesforce is saying, um, let's have a no layoff 90 day reprieve from that. And then there's another org organization called Just Corporation that is keeping track of large, large corporations and if they are laying off or furloughing. But for some small and medium organizations around the world, laying off or furloughing people is going to happen. And so that's part of the tapestry of the entire DNA or CSR and ESG of the organization. And so the question is, okay, if you have to lay off people, how do you do it? So the why is you might have to. What you do is laying off, but how do you do that? Do you just lay them off without notice? Do you um, call them together and say, Will you take 80% reduction so that everybody has a little bit and everybody has a job? And there's some organizations such as IKEA and others that are doing it that way. Or are you like founders, founding farmers in DC, for example, said, we want to lay you off. Yes, we have to lay you off because we're a restaurant and um, restaurants and bars need to be closed. But we want to lay you off first so that you can get in the employment line. We will turn this uh, facility and this restaurant into a market. We will give you 50% off prices for the markets. And so how you actually lay people off and you connect it with the why, the what, and the how, that's really key to showing and demonstrating that you have dignity and respect for your people, who your people are, whether it is just employees, clients, and customers. And so we're seeing all sorts of different responses now with, um, how organizations are dealing with some of these really critical aspects of it. If you go on to the next one, Seth. Is that crisis management, if you look at it as a process, there is 
first a fundamental paradox that the less vulnerable an organization thinks it is, the fewer crises it prepares for. As a result, the more vulnerable it becomes. And so if you have a crisis, um, how is it that you are preparing? What is the timing? So the timing of price gouging, for example, um, that's very opportunistic. Or is the timing that you are aware of and uh, helping people through it? I got to give a shout out, for example, to United. Uh, they came up pretty quickly and said the CEO will take no pay and then the senior executives would have 50% pay. That's significantly different than what, for example, United was doing back in 2001 um, when the CEO quite literally was let go at the end of October because they were looking at something very opportunistic. Um, let's see, you're seeing all sorts of different sort of uh, wonderful behaviors coming out from different organizations of how is it that they care for not just their employees, but their families, the families, the kids, the first responders, um, the NYPD and others. And so this idea of organizations is that it's not a one and done and it's not to prevent every crisis, but how is that you create and develop the resilience and capabilities to roll with the punches? Um, and that's where ESG and CSR ties in because the five ways that ESG ties into businesses is through top line growth, reducing costs, minimizing regulatory pressures, employee productivity and optimizing investments. And if we just pull that thread on employee productivity, the extent to which that you can attract and retain critical employees as well as keep up their morale will help you through this crisis so that when things come back, and it won't be back to normal, it'll be a new normal, but how is it that uh, your employees will want to work with you, will continue to work with you? Um, and it's also part of that top line growth is how is it that you're unleashing the creativity of the employees so that it's new products or new markets? Who knew that distilleries could now make hand sanitizers if they could um, find the appropriate volumes of aloe vera gel and hydrogen peroxide? And so it's this embedded aspect of CSR that if it is built and integrated throughout the entire organization rather than something that is just bolted on is really what's key. Because crisis, if you look at the, um, at the symbols from China of what crisis, it is danger and opportunity. And certainly we're seeing that danger, but there is an opportunity for innovation. And so now the last slide, or the second to last slide, Some of the things organizations need to do may be reasonably simple, but the fact that they don't do them or aren't doing it suggests they're really not easy. So be patient, be compassionate with yourself and your colleagues and your kids and your family and your students, if it will. And then the very last slide, Seth, because there is also opportunity to be innovative, ways in which you can unleash the creativity, ways in which you can start to think about um, rebuilding relationships, whether it is with employees, customers, and suppliers. And it's that triumvirate and how you pull those linkages together that will make some organizations surge even after this, but they'll show that the rhetoric and the reality are both the same. And those are the ones that will double down um, and come through this organization or come through this crisis in a very different path than others might. So there's a 10 minute masterclass on crisis management. Back, Seth, back to you. Great, thank you so much, Jen. And we're gonna move now from the strategic overview into individual case studies. And Nicole Johnson Scales, who is the SVP and Head of Community Development of uh, Fifth Third Bank Chicago, is gonna get us started with a case study of how Fifth Third is responding with purpose in this moment. Nicole? Thanks, Seth, and good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to echo Seth's comment around um, the agility and flexibility, the responsiveness that all of you all have exhibited in this time. It's amazing how in two and a half weeks, how different our world has been. 
and how quickly we have had to adapt to these changes. But the, the great thing about this is, is that I know the leaders that are on this call are built for this. You all are built for the moving forward from a spirit of compassion um, for those that you serve, whether it's from a corporate perspective or from a community perspective. And I just want to honor you all for all that you're doing and all that you will do. So from Fifth Third's perspective, our approach to um, our, our current crisis has really been around uh, the relief, recovery, and resilience of, of our greater community. And as we advance to the next slide, for those of you all who aren't as familiar with Fifth Third Bank, um, we are a financial institution that uh, has been around since over 160 years, um, just under 20 years in the Chicagoland area. In our footprint here locally, we have just under 200 uh, branches in the Chicago and the greater Chicagoland area, in addition to uh, over 3,000 colleagues that call um, the Chicago and greater Northwest Indiana um, home. We expanded our footprint through the acquisition last year of uh, MB Financial, and um, this is, has been a great time for us as we have been integrating as a larger organization for us to really come together and learn um, our, our coworkers in a different way and really move through this crisis together as one team. And so while you'd think on the one hand, it's like, oh boy, you all have had a really great large transaction that could cause a, a great disruption. We see it as an opportunity for us to even um, lock and load even differently than we, we have in the past. From a social purpose perspective, ours is really rooted in who we are as a company. It's really around um, community development and economic inclusion really support, supporting the affordable housing uh, comp component, making sure housing is sustainable, focusing from building capacity and support for small businesses. We are ensuring that we are uh, neighbors from a community development perspective, trying to create um, stable neighborhoods, supporting the assets that are already there. We've got a commitment, as you can imagine, to financial education and really thinking through workforce development and how we can help people move on to, to greater and better um, jobs so that they can provide for, for their families. On the next slide, you will um, see what I would describe as um, how we are moving forward as a company. Um, I'd like to, to phrase it as business forward with empathy and responsiveness. Um, as Dr. Griffin said, it is not business as usual. However, how do you move forward in a crisis um, so that you can continue the business, so that you can support your, your employees, your customers, and other stakeholders that depend on you um, leading within this moment? What I like about this picture uh, here is it was sent and circulated throughout our company. And it's our, as you can see, our, our branch team. And it is how they are showing grace and gratitude um, during this time letting our customers know through the drive-through that we are indeed here for, for you um, and just creating just a stability of, of, um, uh, of, of community and a sense that we are all in this together. And so I thought I'd share that with you all um, because I think it's gonna take more of this as we move forward. So on the next slide, we have um, just our approach in terms of um, how we are trying to be as responsive as possible. Um, what I will say here as a caveat is like many of you, this is where we are in this moment. So Seth, I appreciate your leadership in convening us um, as you always do, because meeting us, meeting in the moment is exactly what we're doing. Friends, two weeks from now, this might look really different. Our approach might be different um, because we have to be responsive to something that we've never experienced before. And so the things that I will share with you are where we are in this moment. Um, but as a, as a company, we know that we're going to have to remain nimble based on the responsiveness to, to those that we serve. So as Jen said, our employees are the, the most important um, part of uh, this response um, to, to, again, the current events. It is about building their morale. It is about encouraging them. Um, our our, our uh, approach to this has really been around safety, compassion, and relief in all categories. And so how do we make our employees, customers, and communities feel safe? How do we do it in a way that um, shows our compassion? And how do we create relief during this time of uncertainty and um, loss of jobs and 
um, getting used to new coworkers that are furry and little people and homeschooling and um, now our homes have daycares. Just how do we consider all of that as we move forward? So before we um, had the shelter in place here in Illinois, we had already begun to have employees work remotely. And um, as we began to hear word of how uh, the, the, the concern around the virus, we did what I'm sure many of you all did, have already done, um, hand sanitizers and other types of um, ways that we could, as employees enter the office to, to try and be mindful. But as we, news became, became um, more um, forth, uh, forthcoming, information became more, more uh, available, we realized that the best way to, to be able to do this is to have employees work from home. The challenge is, is when you have an institution like ours and you need people to be at work to create the stability also for our customers, how can you be creative in the way that, again, is uh, safe and compassionate and provides the relief for our employees, but also making sure that our customers feel strong and stable when you um, continue to hear different things about um, the, the, the uncertainty of the economic stability within the company, within the country. And how do you imagine um, doing that? How do you reimagine how we, we go to work? As you can imagine, we have had really a lot of customers who have just been concerned about the, the safety of, of their money. And so it's our job to really make sure that we are flexible in a way that serves their needs as well as keep, keep our employees safe. And to that end, what we did was we kept our drive through open, uh, increased our capacity there, and then by appointment basis, employee, uh, customers can come visit a banker for their respective needs. Still keeping the, the, the social distance without the social isolation, um, we have been able to continue to move business forward. Employees from a morale perspective has really gone up, which is why you see pictures like that with smiley faces and uh, a desire for employees to, to want to support customers even further. We also have um, instituted a, a four-week sick policy because we know that employees are going to have to take care of loved ones or themselves. We want them to be in a position where they will not lose any salary uh, as a result of um, something that has certainly been beyond their control. And we're also, because we recognize that there are some employees who do not have remote access but need to take care of their families, we also are con continuing pay for those employees so that there's no disruption in their household while they do what they need to do um, best and first, and that's really around taking care of, of their families. And lastly, from an employee perspective, we have instituted um, the Fifth Third uh, CARES Fund, which is our disaster relief, which we stood up um, several years ago as a response to the needs of our employees during times of tornadoes and hurricanes. The nice thing about this is not only is it an investment from the company into this particular fund, but employees also have the ability to support one another with contributions to this fund as well, making it um, more of a we as opposed to, to, to an I, which, which has been really, really helpful. From a customer perspective, again, as I alluded to before, our, our main goal is helping customers feel safe um, and stable in our institution. Um, so that they know that uh, we are continuing as an essential service to create uh, business as usual, business forward for them, um, because they have lots of concerns. We talked about the disruption. We serve a lot of business customers who um, have, could never have planned for something uh, as drastic as this. What we've really focused on from a customer perspective has really been hardship relief and eliminating the concern about making mortgage payments or other type of loan payments back to us, deferring those for 90 days to give people the wiggle room they need to make the right decisions for both their, their, um, their businesses as well as their, their employees. I'd like to also share that one of the things that um, I'm really proud of that our employees have engaged in just from a place of uh, grace and gratitude. Our retail team just, the, just this week has reached out to 15,000 customers to um, assure them of, um, of our commitment to them as, as customers. And um, the, the appreciation that the customers have felt um, through this has been, um, it has just come through in spades. And the pride that our employees feel that they are able to extend 
um, this level of comfort to our customers, just getting that feedback as well has been uh, really encouraging and, and it reminds us and helps us to understand that it is indeed the right thing to do. And lastly, from a community perspective, uh, just this week, we launched a $8.75 million commitment um, to the relief, again, and the recovery and the resilience of our, our greater community. Relief for immediate needs, we invested over $3 million for that, and that's for basic needs like um, um, shelter and, and, and food. One of the things that uh, we also did, again, in the spirit of being agile, when you have a funny name for your company like Fifth Third Bank, you get an opportunity to create your own holiday. And so May 3rd is our holiday where we celebrate community and employees. And usually on Fifth Third Day, what we do is we work together as um, a company to raise money and support those who are food insecure. So one of the things that we wanted to do as part of that basic uh, relief of immediate needs was to push up Fifth Third Day um, make sure that we get the dollars out quickly, um, again, to, to be responsive to, to the need. And the remainder of that commitment has been around uh, the recovery and the relief. How do we invest in the things that we know are going to be um, important to our community and our society when we get to the other side of this? The, the, the opportunity is to face the crisis. The um, the the goal is to overcome the crisis and so that the component of the recovery and relief is to help people through the cri crisis elevating their resilience with the resources that we need to help us to be able to move move forward as well and so again back to rooted to our social purpose around housing supporting our, our small businesses um, in partnership with uh, the city of chicago we committed one million dollars um, to the mayor's uh, $100 million loan pool, which she is um, actively working to uh, get out to small businesses. If you all don't know, small businesses create the uh, most jobs in our economy. And so if they, if they don't survive in a way that allows them to thrive, we're all at risk. And so we were able to, to respond quickly to be able to, to support uh, that component. And to underscore that this was the right thing for our company to do, we, they've already received a thousand requests for these loans to um, be able to keep their businesses afloat. And so we are, we are really proud of that. Lastly, I'll add that we've just kind of pulled in some of our existing resources to help companies move forward. As I shared, financial education is really important to us as a company. And so um, to help uh, the, the new uh, homeschool teachers that, that we have all become, we've made financial education for K through 12 available um, so that uh, uh, students can continue their, their learning. And in addition, we have um, really amplified a program that we have called um, uh, in partnership with Next Jobs. In the 2008 recession, one of the things that we found is that, of course, people cannot make their mortgage payments if they didn't have a job. And so we partnered with Next Jobs to be able to help people get to their next job. And it's amazing how that tool was able to elevate people in, in a time of need. And so we've continued that over the past uh, 10 years. And now we're amplifying it again, making sure that people are aware of it because we know that uh, workforce development is going to be impacted in a really big way. And so um, with that, I hope I didn't go over my time, Seth. I'll, I will hand and yield the floor uh, back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicole. And I think you're a role model for what Jen was describing as the need in this moment for business leaders to see this in human terms first and financial second. And as you were describing, finding that middle of the Venn diagram between what employees need and communities need and, and, and customers need, you know, you certainly got to that sense of humanity. So thank you. Uh, we're going to turn now uh, very appropriately to Matt Simi. We own internet and using technology more than ever before. And he knows a little something about this at Comcast. And they have been truly at the forefront of figuring out how to make the internet and other modes even more accessible in this moment. And so, Matt, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Seth. And, and thank you, everybody, for joining today. I think I want to start with really two acknowledgments and thanks. The first here is you know, we've got to thank our public leaders, in particular our public health leaders, who are giving us incredible guidance every day. While we may be individual companies thinking about what our response is, 
Uh, we're reacting first as human beings and all of our colleagues are thinking about this. They wake up every morning and they go to bed every single night thinking about what additional contributions they can make. And second thanks is really to Loyola for keeping our community moving forward. It is incredibly important right now that we not only share some of these best practices, but that we as individual leaders and in organizations think about how to turn some of the ideas that we're sharing today into practice in real time, because these responses are not static. Every single day here continues to change and the more we can do, the more impact we can have. And someday when we get to whatever we wanna call that new normal, you know, maybe we'll get there before we get to new normal. I think that's really important to kind of have that call to action and that guiding light. So I wanna be a, a touch more granular and kind of walk through some of the things that we're doing, but I wanna talk about it as a, uh, almost a case study in terms of how we get up every day and think about how to put some of those pieces in practice. So hopefully everybody on, on today's uh, uh, conference is very familiar with the company. We are a collection of a number of brands and we like to think about what we do is connecting you to the matter, the moments that matter in your life. And so many of those aspects are very foundational. It's technology, obviously the home internet, but it's also the kinds of information that you rely on that has integrity that you can judge how you're going to live your life on a daily basis. And that's our brands like MSNBC, NBC5 here in Chicago and Telemundo who are critical voices to bringing human stories to life right now. So for us, step one in this response started months ago. As a global company, we are operating actually in China. And so we had a chance to kind of look at what some of the impacts across the company were and very, on, very early on put in place protocols around how to protect employees, but also how to make sure that employee voices were heard throughout the process so that they could bring ideas to the table right away. And the first thing that everybody said was, how do we leverage our core assets to remove barriers so that as we make these rapid transitions to work from home, to learn from home, that we are a very affirmative part of making that transition accessible and that social equity is absolutely deeply embedded in everything that we do. So our first step in this was to add additional capacity by removing cost barriers for low income households and offering 60 days of internet service for free. We announced that two weeks ago, uh, Mayor Lightfoot actually was the first mayor in the country to put that out there. And we have had incredible response to that. But I wanna take a moment and acknowledge that my colleagues, our technicians who do installations are the ones on the front line connecting with families to help bring that to life. And they are doing an absolutely incredible job in this time while maintaining public health guidelines around safety. The second thing that we thought about was how quickly can we bring new benefits to place? So to the point that Nicole made around how do we remove some of the anxiety that people may be feeling, financial pressures, suddenly they're doing video conferences from home and it's a home broadband connection versus what they had at work. So we've removed any disconnect activity. We, are, we don't have usage-based billings, i.e. there are no data caps. We want everybody to be able to explore and use the full power of the internet to maintain commerce, but also to continue to live and learn in the way that makes sense to them. And then third, and Seth, we can go on to the next slide on this. Now, we wanted to make sure that as families and communities were together, what assets we had that we could bring to bear in a way to bring hopefully some moments of joy to folks as well. So we very quickly put together some amazing technology available through our X1 platform. If you say coronavirus into our voice remote, it brings up all the daily news for you. You can sort through it, absorb what you want. But more importantly, we also thought about educators and the families that are in this rapid transition to being home-based teachers. Now I've got two kids myself, we're living exactly through this. And so if you say education into the remote, it brings up unbelievable educational resources that are all uh, supported and evaluated by common sense media and they're on grade level specific activities. So it could be hmm. Khan Academy for teachers that are looking for lessons plans for third graders. It's history vault for lesson programs for kindergartners and others all very easily organized attempting to bring again the kinds of assets that we had 
to life in a way that can continue to make a difference in people's daily lives, but help them transition to what their reality is at the moment. And then finally, and this is the moment of joy, we thought about what can we do in our business model to bring content to people that will matter. We are certainly not the only company doing it and we celebrate all of those that are, but we have brought incredible amounts of theatrical release directly to the home now. We will announce uh, or we will preview on the 10th of, of April, Trolls World Tour, you know, little films that hopefully can help families spend some time together and have some moments of joy. And when they look back and reflect and maybe have some moments that they say really matter to them while we were all sheltering in place, you know, that joy is gonna matter and we want entertainment and that part of it to be part of what we're able to bring as a company. And then we've also accelerated some additional features in our systems. But the next part of this I think is very important and again, builds a lot on what Nicole has said and is reflective of the values of Loyola you know, we thought about what do we have in place in local markets that we can very quickly move to make support of. So hopefully everybody is aware of Chicago Fire, Med, and PD, our shows that are on NBC that are filmed here in Chicago. All of those shows use personal protective equipment. We very quickly worked with the Illinois Department of Public Health to donate masks, gloves, everything that they had so that they could be put to use. We've been told that those were immediately directed to Rockland, Illinois to make a difference in a rural setting. So I would challenge every company to think about if you have any of those things, put them in play. Our public leaders are asking for them. We've all got a way to make a contribution. It can be big, it can be small, but I know this community is absolutely up to that challenge. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that for those community-based organizations, faith-based organizations that not only do we love and respect, but that we're showing that love and respect in a very immediate way by helping them to address issues of payroll and other things. We've made contributions directly into both of the United Way funds that have come together, and we'll continue to provide direct support to organizations where possible. The key in that, of course, is our priority is those direct service organizations that are serving individuals that are at risk on a daily basis so that we can make sure that we are protecting and serving all of the folks who make Chicagoland terrific in what it is. And I think the last thing that I would say is just, again, the sense of community here matters. Go to bed every night thinking about what ideas you've got. Get up in the morning and work with your colleagues inside your organization or outside to make them actionable, because those are the kinds of values that we share as a community. And if we work together, we're gonna to continue to drive all of that forward. Thanks, Seth. Thank you, Matt. And on behalf of uh, myself and my wife, uh, we're grateful for the educational content. And on behalf of my kids, uh, they're looking forward to the trolls. So uh, thank you. And on a, on a very serious note, um, I wanna say that what Comcast is doing we believe really provides uh, best practices anywhere. And so on our website, in the insights, we actually have a case study of Comcast response and tips that you can take out of there for any business. So thank you for being a partner in that process. Um, I'm gonna go on now to Molly Cook. Uh, Molly is the Central Region Community Engagement Leader at EY also been very responsive in this moment. And so, uh, Molly, the floor is yours. Thank you, Seth, and hello, everyone. As Seth mentioned, I'm fortunate to be the Corporate Responsibility Leader for our U.S. Central Region at EY, and also within the last two weeks, I'm a kindergarten teacher, a preschool teacher, and also <laughs> keeping my two-year-old occupied. So, so grateful to have our kiddos at home and safe. And Matt, thank you for helping us entertain them. They're recessed right now, so I can be with all of you here today. But um, you know, EY is a global professional services firm. We have over 260,000 global employees, and our purpose is to build a better working world. And I think that all of you can agree that's a pretty bold, audacious purpose. But one of the ways that we activate that purpose is through our corporate responsibility program, EY Ripples. And Ripples is really all about, you know, empowering our people to leverage their unique EY skills, those skills that they work every day with, with our clients, to make change and impact within our communities. And so Seth, if you want to go to the next slide, like so many other companies out there, we too at EY, we look to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to help really challenge ourselves to identify 
where can we make the most impact? And so we use that as our guiding light. And for us at EY, we look at and see of those 17 goals for peace and prosperity by 2030, where does that align with our unique skills and what societal need is? And it really points to three specific areas that we focus on where we think we can make the most difference. And Seth, if you want to go to the next slide, you'll be able to see that for us, our focus areas are these three concrete areas, supporting the next generation, working with impact entrepreneurs, and accelerating environmental sustainability. This is where we know we can make the most impact in our community. And we're delighted to empower our people to leverage their skills, those skills that they're out working our, with our clients on on a daily basis to make change in the community. And, you know, as I mentioned, we're a global firm. So for our global leaders, they began meeting daily on this exact topic back in January. Certainly there's been an uptick in conversation in the US, but for our global leaders, they were meeting daily in January. And what was their primary focus then, what continues to be now and what will always be is the safety and well-being of our people. And DY has done a phenomenal job of making sure that our people are supported at this time. But our, our global CEO sent us all an email last week and it really resonated with me. I'm sure countless other professionals at the firm where essentially he outlined what our role was in responding to COVID-19. And he broke it down very concrete, what each one of us can do individually. Because I think we all can agree, it can be an overwhelming pandemic to even begin to think, how can we help? And so the first thing he talked about that I think is just reflected and can be um, gained by others is to really make sure that our people's priority and our well-being is of a paramount importance. And so EY has done a phenomenal job of creating more access to mindfulness trainings, having virtual meditation opportunities, having virtual gym passes for our professionals, making sure that all of our EY people, they're not just safe and at home right now, but that we are keeping them sharp from a physical and mental perspective as well. And also identifying that this is a new game, meeting virtually with each other constantly and, and having meetings virtually, it requires a different set of skill sets. And so EY, I think, has done a phenomenal job of giving us trainings of how to lead effective virtual meetings, how to be a transformative leader in a virtual sense as well. And once we can get that right and we're in the process and we're doing that in real time, we really are focusing on attending to our clients and working side by side with our clients who may not even know what their needs are right now, but helping them assess what are their needs and how can we best address them, whether they be supply chain issues, whether they be you know, cash flow modeling challenges that they need to walk through. You know, there, a lot of our clients right now, we're going through our traditional busy season for audit and tax. And so you have filing deadlines that we're approaching from a virtual perspective that we've never done before. And so all of that is uncharted territory, which really brings us to what our response has been from a community perspective. And like I referenced, you know, we have so much thought leadership at our disposal. We are addressing our client needs in real time. And we want to ensure that we leverage that thought leadership and those unique skill sets with our communities right now. And so last week, we began pivoting all of our in-person volunteering to virtual volunteering. And we're thrilled to be working with organizations like Strive for College and iMentor so that our people, as they self-isolate, can continue to build a better working world and can continue to ensure that they are doing their part to feel fulfilled. And whether it be you know, with an organization or an initiative like 100 Mentors Initiative in Greater China, where you send a quick video selfie of 100 seconds answering a math question for a child, there's so much we can do from our homes right now. And we really want to ensure that we give people access to that. You know, Though, when we think about the unique skills that EY has, that I think is where we've been able to really, you know, take it one step further. And last week we connected with all of our flagship organizations. So those nonprofits that we differentiate support to. And we challenged them and we said, listen, you probably don't even know what you need right now, but let us help you identify what you need. We've got great consultants at the firm. Let's understand how can we unpack what your needs are. But then once we identify what your needs are, let EY come in and help you address those. So on Monday, I'm just thrilled to say that we have a professional that previously at EY was helping with do some mergers and acquisitions of major companies. He's going to start working full time virtually for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Milwaukee, and he's going to be supporting the cash flow modeling support role with their CFO directly. And that will certainly help those clubs in Milwaukee, but it will have a ripple effect across the entire Boys and Girls Clubs of America, their 3,000 plus clubs, as well as other different nonprofits. 
We have another nonprofit that we support, Earthwatch Institute, that we do a lot of great collaboration work with. And we are having an individual be deployed to them right now to help them with their HR planning processes. So for us, we know our most valuable resources is our people. And our people have unique skills that our clients need more than ever right now. But we really want to honor our commitment more than ever to build a better working world and to create ripples. And so we are without a doubt, we're deploying our people to our nonprofits in real time and making sure that those pro bono opportunities are ways that we can really leverage our services in a unique and new way. And I don't think we ever anticipated we'd be creating so many ripples so soon, Seth, but I think we're so thrilled that we're, you know, an honor to be in this position. It really is our responsibility. Well, thank you so much, Molly. And it's a great example of what Jen would call a simultaneous solve, where you're figuring out what are our core assets and then how do right. we you know, help the business and help this big issue. And we see this across the economy right now. We see, you know, companies with parking lots offering them so that we can get more testing. We see hotels saying that they will be a place for self-isolation during quarantine because they have much greater vacancy right now and they want to be part right. of the solution. So um, thank you for sharing how EY is part of that. You know, you have talent, they are available and there's this need, how can you make this connection? And it takes higher purpose like yours to get there. So thank you. And we're gonna move on now to the final case study, which is in the health sector. And we thought um, very appropriate given what Matt shared that our public health entrepreneurs are truly at the forefront. They are giving, I mean, literally uh, taking risks of their own life uh, to try to help solve these issues. Um, we should have a healthcare company that is at the forefront and Dina is one of them. And I'm gonna let Tim share more with you. Great, Thank, thanks Seth. And really appreciate what everyone has said here to, you know, today and really appreciate the opportunity for us to, to kind of talk about some of the things that we're doing. And I'm already just so inspired by what I'm hearing from these, uh, these other companies. This is fantastic. We are, we are slightly different than a, than a Comcast or an Ernst & Young or you know, a large bank. We, we, uh, we have probably a few less people than, than some of those companies. We're a, a smaller startup organization that's based here in Chicago. And uh, we've, we've been funded by local uh, groups like Chicago Ventures and the Pritzker Group and other, other local investors. And we've been around um, you know, for, for about four or five years now. And Seth, do you wanna just go ahead to the next slide? Uh, you know, we're just talking about what we do. So we, we founded this company with really this idea of how do, we, how do we help seniors age on their own terms where they want to. And where most folks want to age is, is at home. Uh, and so the, uh, the software that we designed was really based on the experience of our founders when they were really trying to care for aging parents. And, uh, and myself, I, I connected very much with that vision with, with different sort of realities that we had to face with trying to, to care for aging parents. And how do we better streamline that care across the continuum? so that that reality can actually happen, so that they can age where they want to and be able to be provided with the treatment that they wanted to. So this was the idea that we had you know, five years ago, which you know, a few weeks ago became really, really pressing you know, with this need as we were trying to support our customers. Uh, we really found out you know, how serious this was really with a kind of a confluence of events. There was a really large healthcare IT conference that got canceled at the beginning of the month due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, our founders, they, they called me when that happened, and we had a kind of an emergency leadership meeting on that Saturday right afterwards with, you know, what are we going to do? This, this conference has been going on for about 60 years, has 50,000 people. If this is getting canceled, there, there's some serious things that are really we need to make sure we're ready to handle. And so what we ended up doing was having an emergency executive meeting that Saturday. We pulled together our expanded leadership team that Sunday, and, you know, really we were working remote very early on, just based on this idea of how, how, how can we start to protect our people and how can we start to really prepare ourselves to respond to these things. And it's at moments like this, I really appreciated uh, what Dr. Griffin said about how do you roll with the punches, you know, and, and how do you start to make sure that your, your staff and your employees are able to, to really do this. Um, you know, I, I appreciate what others have said too. This is really a human moment. It's not really a business moment. We're all humans first, but how can we use our businesses to respond to that? So Seth, if you want to go to the next slide, you know, this is where we're, we're really guided by our values, our vision and our mission. But like others have said, this is when that's all tested. It's easy to put these things on a piece of paper. It's easy to hang it in your office. It's easy to do a lot of those sort of things. But when you're actually into, you know, a really hard sort of environment, are you going to actually abide by those? 
And so what we wanted to make sure is that, you know, not only were we living our vision to try to empower everyone to age where they want and get the treatment where they want, but how can we make sure that our employees were also able to, to really respond and we were able to be there for them. So Seth, if you will go to the next slide there. You know, the way that we usually try to, you know, put our, our vision into action is with this idea that our founder talks a lot about with karmic capitalism, where we really want to make sure that we succeed when we deliver on our promise of helping seniors and able to help these hospitals and health plans that we serve. And how do we do that is really with this idea of we try to hire people that are really in, in tune with our values, with our focus, and to make sure that they were really folks that want to want to have the same sort of results and impact on the world that, that our founders do. So that really results in a, in a very enthusiastic staff. I think that our customers have often said to us, they really kind of see that reaction when they interact with our people. And so because of that, we end up having a strong, loyal customer base. So, that, you know, this is kind of just the way that we operate, just a little bit of background. So Seth, let, let's transition though to I think the next slide, which is really what, what happened. You know, so on that call Saturday, you know, what did our leadership team decide to do? And, and really what we decided to do was mobilize on a three-point plan. Um, you know, and how could we put this into action really quickly? So we mobilized, but with first this idea that we really needed to make sure that our employees were healthy and safe. So this was the idea of right away, we cut off all travel. We made sure that anybody that was going to, uh, to help all of our customers that we have across the country, that they were grounded. You know, that we would reschedule to Zoom meetings. We made sure that everybody, we had an email that went out that Sunday night that, hey, we're, we're gonna work remote, you know, starting, starting tomorrow. We're gonna have a, an all hands meeting first thing in the morning to explain why and kind of go through some of those things that were happening. And that's been our commitment to our employees is that we, every Monday now we start with an all hands meeting where we talk about how things are going. Now there's a lot of challenges though that when you move to remote staff as I think we're all, all working with, we all have unique situations. I, I have four very uh, rowdy boys, you know, all under the age of 13 in our house. That, that has its own unique challenges. They're all sad that they're not playing baseball right now. And so instead they're starting to use their brothers as baseball equipment. So, you know, those are our unique challenges that we have to deal with. You know, other employees, they don't, they, they're alone. You know, maybe they have a pet or maybe they don't. You know, everyone's very different with the, uh, their circumstances. So because of that, you know, it, it's fun. Our, our leaders, our employees, we've started to organize virtual coffees in the morning to meet with people, to be able to just kind of hang out and talk and kind of catch up the same way you would if you were in the office. We're doing some virtual happy hours where you can have your beverage of choice and just kind of unwind at the end of the day and, and, and talk through some things. We're doing virtual lunches, which, you know, sometimes you want to mute your video when, when that's happening, you know, when you're uh, eating and those sort of things. But we're just making sure that we all feel connected to each other, that our employees feel really safe. Um, you know, the other thing that we realized very quickly, and Seth, you alluded to this, is that we, we realized that we could be part of the solution. Uh, we, we represent a, a very large home health company. Um, Beata Home Health, and uh, their, their uh, owner, David Beata, called our founder you know, that week and said, listen, we have 30,000 staff across the country who are going to be going into people's homes. You know, this is what we do. They are home care and home health workers. They're like, your app can help us. You know, here's some of the things we want to do. Can you jump on a call? So we jumped on a call with our customers that Sunday to really understand how, how could we help. And we realized really quickly that even though we're a small company, we've got a, the ability to really kind of help make sure not only are our employees safe, but the, the employees of our home health customers, of our hospitals, of our health plans that we represent, that they're safe. So we pulled together um, you know, a couple of things really quickly that Seth, if you wanna to go to the next slide, I'll, I'll describe a little bit. You know, we really kind of put together an employee safety screening tool that, uh, you know, that Beata was able to use. We kind of uh, tuned some of our own software that we already had. We, we are a remote monitoring and care coordination company. So it was kind of in our wheelhouse already but we had to make some really rapid changes and how do we change our roadmap and you know our limited development resources to really kind of meet this need so we rapidly did that and and you know in the last two weeks been we've been rolling out these tools to you know to those 30,000 staff for that company uh, for other hospital systems across the country you know in the Philadelphia area in the New Jersey area you know in and of course locally in some of the hardest hit areas that's where our customers are and so we've been able to do this um, in in New York we're, we're rolling these things out with a really just kind of simple tool that allows people and managers to be able to check on their staff. First of all, you know, are you showing symptoms? Are you healthy? Are you safe? Because if you're not healthy and safe, how are you going to go care for these other people? It's a big concern right now is the capacity, not just of how to, you know, the patients, but the staff that's taking care of these patients. How do you make sure that they're doing okay? So we, we rapidly created a bunch of these tools and started to roll them, roll them out. Um, 
you know, I think that uh, as we're doing this, it's actually been motivation for our employees because, you know, I think all of us hate feeling helpless, you know, and I see the comments that are out there about how can we get involved? How can we do something? I think for our company, it was a rallying call that we can not just sit around, you know, remote, but we, we can actually really get involved and, and do something here. And so it's been, you know, for us, this has been one of our busiest times ever. We have staff that's working around the clock. And so for us, it's also how do we now take care of our own employees and not burn them out or make them more susceptible to illness because they're now fatigued or tired as they're trying to meet this demand. So it's an ongoing cycle of those things that we're trying to do. So Seth, if you wanna to go to our, our last slide here. You know, really, you know, for us, our, our currency as a company is what are our customers say about us? How are we meeting the needs that are there? And so it was great to be able to have, uh, you know, Matt Kroll, who's the practice president for Bayada Home Healthcare, to really kind of give us, you know, this nice sort of, uh, you know, shout out after we've been working with them for the last week. We told them that we'd be able to get on this webinar. And he wanted to, to really kind of talk about this, how we've been able to respond with their company to really meet this need and to be out there. And they feel like their staff is, is feeling better taken care of. High, high response rate on the app that we're using. And, you know, people have been found that have COVID-19 and they're able to respond quickly. So it's great to be able to be, be part of that solution. You know, I, again, I know we're, we're short on time, but really appreciate this opportunity to kind of talk about some of the things that, that we're doing. Um, it's great to be able to make an impact. It's great to be with a lot of like-minded people here. You know, I think this is inspiring for me, you know, on a Thursday during lunch for all of us to sit together, a couple hundred people to just kind of talk about how can we help, you know, make, make lives better across the world. And so it's, it's really inspiring to me. So appreciate the opportunity here, Seth, and I'll, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Tim. And I just want to say how inspired we are by what you're doing. You know, you hear these cases of uh, elderly homes where, you know, people are dying and you think about what it means that you're helping the people that are going into those homes to learn if they might have COVID-19 and then not to pass it on. And I mean, if you think about 30,000 people having that tool, which you developed over two weeks using just, you know, your capacity on to businesses and you think about how many lives are going to be saved. But then you also think about the business case, right? Think about how inspired your employees are to be part of a company that decides to use its resources for that purpose and how that's going to drive staff enthusiasm and customer loyalty. You know, it really is doing well and doing good at the same time. So um, we have heard wonderful case studies. Um, we have gotten a chance to answer many of your questions over Zoom chat. I want to make sure we have two minutes now to go to Destiny Ortega. She is from the Civic Consulting Alliance, which has been tasked by the mayor's office to help bring together the business community at this moment. They are a wonderful partner of ours. And so Destiny, uh, if you don't mind, close us out, share you know, what you're up to and how others can know about and potentially be involved in what's next. Thank you, Seth. Uh, so excited to be part of this conversation. It's so inspiring. I'm Destiny Ortega with Civic Consulting Alliance. We are a nonprofit social impact consulting firm here in Chicago. And as Seth mentioned, we are stepping up to support the city's COVID-19 response, specifically around the policy interventions that would mitigate the social and economic impacts of this crisis. A key part of our support is managing the interface between the city and the corporate community. And that involves three things. First, sharing information and documenting all of the existing corporate activities and investments that are being made, like we heard on this, on this call. Second, identifying opportunities to better align public and private resources, as well as where there might be over or under investment of resources. And then finally, creating a two-way feedback loop to inform the city's policy interventions and bolster corporate participation. So in the coming weeks, we'll be working with corporate conveners like the Bomb Heart Center to understand the current landscape of all corporate priorities and activities in response to the current crisis. Um, and through that, we'll be creating virtual spaces and tools to facilitate real-time two-way communication between the corporate community and the city. So that said, stay tuned for more communication from the Bomb Heart Center on behalf of Civic Consulting Alliance. We'll be in touch soon. Well, so thank you all for joining us. We have reached our, our time frame. I just want to say we will have continued conversations and we look forward to having you all as part of them. Uh, this is a difficult moment, but as we heard on this call, uh, it can really uh, bring out the best and hopefully uh, we will continue to see that from the business community and beyond. So um, thanks especially to our incredible panelists and not only for what you shared, but even more for what you're doing. 
Uh, thank you all. Have a good rest of your day and stay safe, uh, healthy, and wash your hands. Uh, bye, everyone.